All right. Uh, I'd like to call the November 9th, 2021 discussion meeting to order. We all stand uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, one nation, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, roll call, Ms. Macro, please. Dr. Anderson. Here. Mr. Caligiri. Here. Mr. Colson. Here. Mr. Devine is not in attendance this evening. Mr. Hill. Here. Mr. Kolar. Here. Mrs. Stepnik is not in attendance this evening. Mr. Tomarello. He will not Is not in attendance this evening. Ms. Wetmore. Present. And student representative, Ms. Drapcho. Here. The, the board met in executive session on November 9th, 2021 to discuss matters of litigation, safety, personnel, and real estate. We'll uh, then have citizens' comments on agenda items, and Ms. Macro will uh, give you some information on that. Anybody in the audience that would like to make a citizen's comment on agenda items, we ask that you step forward to the podium one at a time. Um, once you step to the podium, please state your name your residence within Plum. You will have five minutes to speak. Um, we will put a timer on the board so you can keep track of your time and I will give you a 30 second warning when your time is coming to a close. We ask that you speak directly to the presiding officer rather than questioning individual members, um, that you speak for yourself and not on behalf of others or as a representative of another organization is there anybody in the audience at this time that would like to make a comment? <clears throat> no comments at this time. I turn it back to Mr. Caligiri. Thank you, Mrs. Macro. Uh, we'll move on to uh, personnel. That's me, Lee Board Liaison. Um, nothing for me to report. I'll let uh, administration if they have something, but I do want to recognize all of the facilitators of Rachel's Challenge for a remarkable job in their facilitation of the early start of the program. And then the follow-up afterwards that's been coming out around the challenges that the students have. I think uh, today I saw that one of the challenges was to introduce yourself to someone you don't know and tell them your name. So um, they have a long-term plan in place to make sure that this stays sustainable and that the children benefit from it. So I thought the facilitators from really all of our departments did a wonderful job. So we just wanted to recognize that. Next is student achievement and activities. Dr. Anderson, lead board liaison. Yes, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. <clears throat> yes. So we have a number of grants and donations to move forward. Does anybody have any objections to those? No objections. Okay, we'll move those forward. And then, um, Dr. Walsh, I believe you guys have a presentation on credit recovery. We did, Dr. Anderson. Uh, about a year ago, the board charged the administration with finding ways that we could support our students over the summer months. And last year, um, we built out an approach, we deployed it, we offered tutoring services, we offered grade replacement, grade recovery, uh, we offered extended school year, opened up our resources at no charge to any of our families or any of our students. Through that process, um, we received a lot of positive feedback from our, from our students that participated and from families. One in particular, I will tell you that I thought was just touching. We had eight seniors that uh, participated in uh, credit recovery and grade replacement that had the opportunity to graduate over the summer months. Mr. Official and his team uh, put together a ceremony uh, right outside the front office 
in the look on the students' faces, their families, the sense of pride, um, it, was, it was just touching. What I would share with you is that what we learn, especially in credit recovery, is that there's an opportunity there for us to look at that a little differently. And that's what we're here tonight to present. Uh, under the direction of uh, Mr. Hartman, uh, Ms. Chrisman, who's a department leader for our school counselors, and Mr. Fischel, the high school principal, they've been working with the high school team, pupil services, in regards to, is there a solution to find a win-win here? So that our students, particularly those eight students last summer, would have an opportunity to graduate with their peers and with the community on time. We believe we find a solution to that, and that's what we're going to present this evening. So um, I'll turn this over to Mr. Hartman for more information. Thanks, Dr. Walsh. Um, so Dr. Walsh uh, hinted towards, we, we kind of came out, this came about of, of last year, um, and specifically when we were developing our credit recovery and grade replacement programs. Um, I spoke with many districts in the surrounding area and realized a common thread, or a common trend, I should say, that a lot of those districts relied on the IUs in, in those areas. Um, and they were you know, spending money um, to provide the services for the students that I realized with what we adopted here with the PDLA program that we could provide ourselves without any additional cost to the district. And so taking that, um, as you know, we developed the summer uh, recovery program. We had 144 students that took over 276 credit recovery grade replacement courses. Over 200 of those students successfully completed those courses with passing grades. And as Dr. Walsh said, 11 seniors and eight of them were able to uh, earn their diploma. And we had a small ceremony, which was amazing to see those kiddos and their families actually you know, shake Mr. Fischel's hand and, and receive their diploma um, and have that kind of opportunity. And it kind of dawned on us, that why can't we do this before the summer happens? Why can't we do, find a way to integrate this into the school year and help those seniors and kind of catch them before they, they fall into that and we can have them participate with the rest of their peers? And so doing so, um, you know, we kind of learned some lessons along the way and specifically that there's an opportunity for those students and families to still be part of the, the graduation ceremonies and, and all of the other excitement that comes at the end of the school year. And so that was kind of one of the really big aha moments that we had. And along the way in, in talking with Ms. Chrisman and Mr. Fischel, how do we offer and, and provide some of those supports to our seniors throughout the school year that we can A, help to try to um, catch those seniors before this happens, but then B, if in fact we do have some seniors that still aren't able to meet those expectations, can we provide some credit recovery for them at the end of the year? And uh, that's what Ms. Chrisman, I'm gonna turn it over to her, she's gonna speak a little bit about some of the interventions that we do throughout the school year presently. So I wanna first cover what we do um, for every student, um, and that is giving our students the opportunity to improve their grade um, throughout the school year. So that is our academic accountability, 50% um, procedure. So if a student earns below a 50% in one of their nine weeks, they'll earn that grade. Then in the subsequent nine weeks, if they earn a passing score, their previous nine week score will go up to a 50%. Um, during the fourth nine weeks though, that student will earn whatever grade they have earned. Um, so in addition to this, I always say that this is operation graduation is on from first quarter. Um, you can read up here, these are most of our um, procedures that we do, but in a nutshell, as soon as the student is identified from the first quarter, from a report that's pulled, um, any student that is failing or has like a lower C, counselors are then on top of that. We um, make sure that we make contact with, you, with each student, so we have meetings. Um, we monitor their, their progress. If a student's progress continues to decline over those next couple of nine weeks, um, we definitely up the ante there. We give them a plan. We're meeting with them weekly. Um, we're calling parents. We make sure that we have meetings with parents. Um, we do everything in our power to ensure that that student has every opportunity to ensure that they can graduate. Um, we reach out to teachers and make sure those teachers and that's kind of brainstorm together to come up with ways for that student to, you know, to earn the grade that they can to graduate. Um, so it is a very busy time for us. We also send letters out to parents um, if their student is in danger of failing every quarter. 
Um, by that third quarter, we know, we run the numbers, we know like if that student is on the cusp and what we have to do to get them to pass, we know if the student is not going to graduate. Um, and that's when we have those hard talks with parents. Um, and that's why this would be such an amazing opportunity for a lot of those students, um, you know, when they just don't realize the, the grave danger of that fourth nine weeks closing. So if you really think about it, there are few things in life that are once in a lifetime opportunities and walking at graduation for high school is one of those. And as Dr. Walsh said, we really are looking to provide that for our seniors. Uh, counselors will perform an audit at the end of the third nine weeks and students who have failed the course without a statistical chance to pass will be allowed to complete a credit recovery course during that last nine weeks. Now again, this is only for those students who by the time they get to the fourth nine weeks, there's no chance for them to pass that class. Historically speaking, we're talking about five to 10 students. Seniors in the credit recovery classes will be placed into, the, into a study hall or can use our PDLA drop-in center here in the library to complete their course. They will have eight weeks to complete it. The original failing grade will stay on the transcript and then the recovery will be added. This is a last chance attempt to include all of our seniors in this once in a lifetime experience of walking a graduation. So our recommendation to you uh, is to um, move forward with our approach in building out the credit recovery courses through the PDLA program that would be then implemented in the fourth marking period for those specific seniors that Mr. Fischel um, spoke to. The council's administration will continue to collect data uh, throughout the school year and identify those potential seniors uh, that may need the credit recovery and then creating a list of those students in danger of failing for the teachers, counselors, and administration to all reach out to and communicate with those students and families. Again, the goal here is for every teacher to help those students find success throughout the school year, but ultimately we're looking at just a small handful of students that may need this credit recovery option, but we want to try to help them meet those requirements within the regular structure of the school year. Students would then be enrolled in the PDLA courses beginning at the fourth marking period and they would have roughly you know, approximately eight weeks to complete the coursework. If they successfully complete it, then those seniors and families would be able to participate in all the graduation activities and ceremonies. Um, and then moving forward, we would integrate and include this uh, credit recovery option for the seniors during the first quarter into the program of studies for the 22-23 school year and thereafter. Uh, I'd like to open it to the board. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to, to talk further, try to answer anything that I can. Is there a, um, um, uh, an amount, so say maybe they need to take more than one credit recovery course. Is there a limit to how many they can take in that last eight weeks where they'll still be able to graduate on time? Yeah, I think part of the big piece of this is we, we want to try to catch those seniors that we notice that may be in danger of failing way before we get to the opportunity where they, we're going to need to do this. So as those things are happening, certainly those conversations would be happening with those students, the teachers, their parents, the families, to try to develop those plans for success throughout the school year. Um, I, th I think with, it'd be on a case-by-case -case basis if we got to that point, Mr. Hill, where we realize that a student might need more than, than one or two classes to successfully graduate. It might be a little bit more in-depth of a conversation of potentially having to maybe do a couple if they can get those done in the fourth quarter, then looking at credit recovery in the summer to still, again, get their diploma at some point. Right. But, you know, depending on the circumstance and the amount of courses, that would have to be a case-by-case -case basis. I saw the reference to the NCAA eligibility. Do you have any uh, insight on how that might realistically play out for some of the, the kids? Absolutely. Uh, if you look at our program of studies, Plum High School program of studies, page 13, 14, and 15 has a description of the NCA courses 
and what that means for a student who's looking to go to a Division I or Division II college. And credit recovery credits do not fill um, those requirements for NCAA. So we would look at that, like Mr. Hartman said, on an individual basis. Those students, we'd have to take a look and say, did they have, if you look at page 14 on our program of studies, it gives you a list of the courses that you need. And so we'd have to do an audit and see if they had it. But those credit recoveries do not fulfill those requirements. Sure. Is there an opportunity to help um, the students? So I'll kind of speak to that, Mr. Kelly Jr. Um, <laughs> for, our, for our students who do identify for NCAA and they want to continue on in college playing, we make sure those conversations are happening, happening in ninth grade. So that way we, we're not getting to that point, come 12th grade, the, you know, the 12th hour. These students already know that, that that's their plan and we ensure to tell them and remind them and have meetings with them um, a little more um, in regards to the NCAA eligibility and let them know, you know, these are your courses, this is what you need to do, these are your requirements. <coughs> and I know over the last, you know, this going into my third year here, I have not had a student who is NCAA eligible um, fail any courses. Okay, yeah, that's great. We know that athletics for some kids can be a pathway towards success and motivation when they do get to the college ranking. So, you know, it's something to consider. I assume there's no other NCAA requirements other than athletics, correct? I mean, uh, you'd just otherwise be eligible or up approved to enter your academic placement. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. That's really helpful. What types of resources? I think you mentioned this would be done in like study halls and things like that. What types of resources would be made available to these students to help them be successful in, in, in graduating on time? Do we have like student tutors that can help them or, or teachers? or? Yeah, I'll, I'll just yeah, go speak. On, go on. <laughs> um, so the one nice part of, of how we've been able to integrate PDLA into how we operate and who we are, you know, this year we've had teachers now that have those PDLA courses that are signed to their daily uh, schedules. So now we have teachers that are available during the school day to offer assistance to students virtually. If those students that may be here in the building, um, if it works out that a teacher is able to stop into the study hall or they can set up an appointment or a meeting to sit down one-on-one, -on -one, uh, it's much more feasible that can happen, especially if those students that are here in the building um, are, you know, we have access to the rest of the resources that would be available, whether it's, you know, in the counseling office, other people, services, and other things that might be available. And Mr. Fishel, is there anything else you want to speak to? Yeah, I just want to say that usually when we get to that point, our teachers and guidance counselors, it's all hands on deck. I can tell you last year being a little bit of a different year with the COVID, um, I was having emails with a teacher on a Sunday evening to try to get a student to where she needed to be for Monday morning when the grades closed. So there's a sense of urgency. The teachers are involved, the counselors are involved, administrators are involved. If they come in to the library to do their credit recovery and they're here and they have a question, I can almost guarantee you that we'll have a teacher that would make themselves available to that student to help in any way they could. Again, it's all hands on deck. We really pull it all together and, and pull all the stops out for those kids. We'll be able to provide like office hours. I know, you know if you go to college, just that mm -hmm. all professors have office hours. Or is there something like that where they would just be able to drop in? Yes, and, between 2.15 and 2.50 each day. Um, our teachers have tutoring time. And so they could utilize that also. Nice. So every attempt is made. Yeah. And I just want to say that I appreciate your effort to make sure these kids get the opportunity to walk. But I had the opportunity to attend the ceremony you guys put together for those kids who did graduate off date. And um, you did a really great job. And it was really wonderful that they had that opportunity. So thanks to you guys. Thank you. Any other questions? Then I guess the question is uh, if the board willing to move this forward. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And on my computer, I see a little guy walking back. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, I just wanted to one thank you for uh, 
for all the work that you guys have done on it. And two, I think what what matters the most in this situation, you guys have all down it, is just the proactive nature of it. And I really appreciate just the data-driven emphasis that we're having and that our guidance counselors are paying attention to that and that we're able to offer this in order to, I mean, in order to have all hands on deck and break speeds across the finish line for that. And I think, you know, my, my daughter was one who took advantage of a uh, grade replacement last year and it was a, an incredibly positive experience for her. It wasn't a credit recovery, it was a grade replacement, but I would presume it would be the exact same way. Um, and so I'm excited for this to be an offering for our students to be able to even walk on time, you know? Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. And by the way, for everyone, home soccer is up three to one. Our girls are up three to one right now. And volleyball is down one nothing right now. But getting text updates on it, so so fun. Thanks, Gus. I assume we uh, well. Do we have any objections to this uh, proposal? No. No. Okay, Dr. Anderson, do you have anything else that you'd like to add? <clears throat> no, not at this time. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, we'll move on to safe and supportive schools. Mr. Hill and Mr. Tom are out of the board liaisons. Obviously, Mr. Hill will handle that today. I'm uh, just going to discuss the uh, PCR voluntary testing in the uh, the <laughs> <laughs> You get whiplash. You're used to looking back at him <laughs> for that. Okay, so um, first off, um, Jen, if you could get the presentation up so that everyone can see this. As we painfully all know, um, the district has, and all districts throughout the state, throughout the country, have had to go through mitigation efforts, um, wanted and unwanted. Um, schools have had to do their very best to try and mitigate the spread of COVID-19 within the buildings. <clears throat> and that comes in many forms, whether it's uh, vaccination, whether it's three feet social distancing, whether it's masks, um, there's, there's a host of different mitigation strategies that are out there. Um, needless to say, um, we try and have as many as we can without impacting the education of our, of our students um, and trying to get back to as normal as possible as quickly as we possibly can. And so an opportunity has come across in the state of Pennsylvania. I think, uh, I don't think, I know most of the money is coming from uh, the federal government with regard to some of those mitigation efforts. And one of those is, in fact, uh, trying to uh, test as much as possible uh, to get kids um, to determine whether students are positive or negative. And if they're negative, get them back into school as quickly and as efficiently as we possibly can. And so the state um, has come forward with a, um, a testing program. And there are three prongs to the testing program. Um, there were um, pool testing, which you could go into classrooms and do individual pool testing on um, certain classrooms. Um, let me be clear, the Plum Borough School District has no interest in doing that, and we are not looking to do that at all. Um, if a district chose not to do the pool testing, they could do diagnostic testing. And there were two options that the state provided in those, uh, those two types of testing. One is the antigen, which is the rapid test, and most people are familiar with the rapid test. The other one is uh, the PCR test. The state, uh, through the Department of Health, um, gave districts an opportunity to choose one of those two options. As a team, um, we wanted to bring forward to the board the notion of uh, choosing between the two. We wanted to go with the PCR test because it is considered from what the Department of Health uh, and their, um, their contracted agent, which is concentric by Ginkgo Bioworks, indicated it's the gold standard of testing for COVID-19. The thing that concerned us about the rapid testing is that it did have false negatives. Um, and so we wanted to try and be as accurate as possible. And so the state allotted $338 million for school districts to look into whether they wanted to have a program for their particular school districts. So um, we met with uh, representatives from Ginkgo Bioworks. We met as an administrative team uh, to determine whether it would, this would be a good recommendation for our kids. And if you could go to the next slide, Jen, we determined that it would be a good recommendation for our kids, mainly for a couple reasons. 
Number one, it is voluntary. Nobody has to do it. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. Um, two, we believe that it's going to help keep kids in school because right now we have the quarantine process, which everyone is uh, painfully familiar with. The kids can be out of school for as long as 10 days in that quarantine process. Our thinking is, is if we can get them in school sooner and provide a testing service for our parents so that they don't have to go to Monroeville or they don't have to go to their doctor's office, they can do something that's convenient at night and all they'd have to do, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is come up, drive through, get out, go to the security desk, take the test, and it's within 48 hours you get the test results back. So what we're thinking is that it's going to be able to keep our kids in school, especially those kids who are symptomatic, because this is um, focused on those kids who are symptomatic. And as we get closer to the cold and flu season, we're going to have more and more kids present with sim symptoms that could be COVID, but may not end up being COVID. So we want to try and get those kids back in school as soon as, as we possibly can. There is also the potential that the CDC may loosen up some of the quarantine rules and they may be offering what's referred to as a test to stay. If in fact if the CDC changes the guidelines for quarantining, we, should, we will be prepared uh, to be able to enact that and get our kids back into school sooner. So let's go through how this would work. Again, I, I want to stress to everyone, if you go to the next slide, this is totally voluntary. We don't have the dates exactly when it's going to start. We have some individuals that are going through training uh, to be able to administer the test. What would happen is students would have to pre-register to get a test. Um, right now, those under 18, their parents would sign them up through the online process. There is a quirk in the PA uh, registration or reg regulations that indicate if you're 18 years or above, as of right now, you have to fill it out in paper. For some reason, I don't know why that is, they're looking at changing that. Our representative from um, Concentric indicated that that might be coming sooner rather than later, but as of right now, those 18 and older have to fill out a piece of paper. Um, and that can be done at this security gate. So we have two um, pictures here. One is uh, a, a map of heading into the school where most of you obviously you've gotten this far and the library is off to the right on the first or second building there. But if you drive a little bit further, you'll obviously run into the security vestibule, which is on the right hand side. What a, an individual will do is go to the next screen, Jen, is if a parent feels as though their kid uh, needs a test or has been recommended by maybe the school nurse or their own physician and they want to get a COVID-19 test, they can go ahead and do that. All they have to do is go to the online consent form, which is there. Um, they would have to put in the school code to where they go to school. And if you click on that, Jen, you'll be able to show everybody the codes for each individual school. It is a, an extremely simple process to sign up for this. Again, as I indicated in number three, if you're 18 years of age or um, older, you would have to do the online form and that is also linked. And the community has access to this website or to this PowerPoint presentation. So you can go through and look through all the links. I think that was posted last night. So what would happen? You would come, you would uh, pre-register the child and the parent, if, if so, the uh, parent wants to do that, can come up to the window. They would be handed a a, a testing kit which would be slid underneath the security vestibule they would take up open it up there is a kit that looks like this I want to show the board so that they have a pretty good understanding of what this looks like they would slide this under the security vestibule before they do the person who's at the security desk would make sure that their online consent form is there they would open up their online consent form and they would scan this in. So this is registered to that particular person. That person would open it up and then they would get out the specimen kit. And basically they would have to spit about this much into this. They would take it off. They would take this, screw it on, and then they would shake it for five seconds. And then they would put it in a box. 
on the right hand side or the left hand side. At the end of the night, the person that's in the security vestibule, we have FedEx coming at 715 to be able to pick up all the samples. And we should get the results within, no, they're saying, they're kind of lowballing it a little bit, but they said no more than 72 hours, but what the guy said is they're getting it in less than 48 hours. So our parents would have the opportunity to know whether their kids are positive or negative. Um, now, the question is who gets the results? If a child comes back positive, um, the parent would get a phone call from a concentric physician indicating that they have a positive result. They would call three times uh, and hopefully they would be able to get a hold of someone. The only people that would also have access to those results would be the school nurse. Um, and the school nurse already has access to that. In addition, the other people that would have access to it are contact tracers so that they could contact the person and guide them through the next steps. If they're negative, they would get an email from our nurse probably the next day after they have the opportunity to review the results and let them know that their tests are negative. So really, it's that simple. The whole idea is just to provide a free, convenient um, access point for our parents so that they can hopefully if they feel it's necessary or their medical um, uh, person that gives them medical advice indicates that a test is necessary, we can get them back into school sooner. So hopefully I gave you a pretty good overview of the testing process and I can take any questions that you may have. Any questions or comments? I would say it seems like a much better process than the nose swabs. I'm sorry. Oh, I said I, I would say it seems like a much better system than the nose swabs for kids. So. Yeah, and then for the for the time it takes to get the test back, they they can flex if they want to as well. So they would their nurse would walk walk them through whatever process they have. Mm -hmm. So if they're at home for two day, if they're at home because they're symptomatic on the second day, Jenna the nurse should advise them that they are on flex. Okay. Yeah, they send an approval to you to say that your child's been approved for flex for that at least the next day and then they review things. Anything else? So currently, oh, I'm, did Dr. A have a question? Hmm. Um, so currently we have um, our test supervisors, they have to go through one last part of the training process. Um, as soon as everybody is trained and we're ready to go, we would send out a letter to the community, community indicating that in fact we're beginning this process and have an actual date. Our goal is to have it somewhere in the neighborhood of Thanksgiving to begin the process. It would probably be Monday through Friday between five and five o'clock and seven o'clock when people would be able to come up and get the test. And it's open to students and employees. Um, what type of, and these are gonna be the contract tracers that work after hours that will be doing the testing? They would be taking the sample? Taking yes, the sample, yeah. taking the sample. Or it could, it could be anyone that's trained. Okay. Um, do we have security guards that work the desk as well that would be trained or? Uh, we could, but we're not going to at this point. Okay. And just to be clear, the registration process will limit the number of people so that it's not an overwhelming process? Or is it if you go online and register you and show up that five to seven? So um, I think we can accommodate a lot of people. So once they sign up, most of the hard work is doing the online process. Uh, once they do the online process and they come to the desk, They'll be given the, the sample. They'll, be at, they'll ask, have to ask a couple questions, which is also on the presentation. But I think we can, we'll be able to handle a high volume of folks. You know, what we would suggest is when someone's at the window, you would wait until that person's gone from the window and then the next person would come up. But I do think it's a very, very quick process. I don't think it's gonna take very long at all. So I think we could take a high volume, Mr. Wetmore. Do you think we would open this up to um, families, including parents and and kids in the same home? I asked that question. We're not permitted at this point. It's only students and employees. And they know that it's a student and employee then? 
well, we would want to be honest and make sure we only take <laughs> students and employees. <laughs> We, we, I had to sign assurances saying we would do certain things. Oh, well. So I would want to keep my good name. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Do we have any objections? Or maybe for this one I should ask, do we have five to move this forward? Looks like we don't have any objections. Next up is, uh, there's one more item, right, uh, Mr. Hill? Yeah, where am I at here? Oh, uh, the vaccination clinic. Uh, where we're talking about holding a voluntary clinic. So we are in the very early stages of trying to determine whether we would offer um, a, a vaccination clinic here at the school. Um, I've been in contact with two particular outlets. Um, one is Giant Eagle and one is a pharmacy that I, I know of in Mount Lebanon. Um, we are trying to set something up for November 20th and the idea would be is that it would be, uh, and that's a Saturday by the way, um, it would be for anyone that wants the flu vaccine, anyone that wants a booster, or anyone that wants to immunize, immunize those uh, children that were between <coughs> 5 and 11. Um, but anybody can get the vaccine. and so. Our opportunity uh, that we want to be able to do is, again, try and keep kids in school as much as possible. Um, kind of goes along with the PCR testing. Mm -hmm. And um, again, that's voluntary. So um, if people are interested, they can come. But tentatively, we're looking at uh, November 20th in, in, the, uh, in the main gym. And since this is a private company owning the clinic, is there any liability to the district if somebody were to have a negative reaction to one of the vaccines? Um, so they're filling out the, the form to hold the event. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they know that they have the liability when they're um, when they are the one that's administering the shot. We're just the facility that's holding it. Do we have care in place in the event somebody does have a? So I did reach out to um, Mr. Maloney, who's the head of Plum EMS, and he indicated that they would have volunteers there awesome. if, in fact, it was necessary which we believe it would be. Yeah. And just to be clear, this is essentially the same process that any outside group would go through to hold uh, an event on our, on our sites. Is that correct? Or are there any differences that we should be aware of? Um, we did do the same thing in the spring last year, and we're also going to invite Riverview because we worked with Riverview last um, last time in the spring, and they actually called and asked if they could participate if we had something, and we said sure they could. Um, but it would be the same exact process that we went through in the spring last year, Mr. Calger. Do you know what that participation was like? I can't give you exact numbers. It wasn't it wasn't an overwhelming amount of people. For some reason, Mr. Hill, 90, 90 sticks in my mind, but I can get you a more accurate number of how many people participated. And, and I would add that other districts are doing this. In fact, some districts are doing this during school hours, are making um, these vaccines available. So the fact that we are doing this on a Saturday outside of school hours, um, I think should add a layer of comfort to those in the community who do not want vaccinations and um, so I'm glad that we've, we've kind of thought about that. We are pretty sensitive. Kids have missed enough school. Um, we don't want them to miss any more school. So that's kind of why uh, we were looking at a Saturday. Uh, so that one, it's voluntary. There was no pressure on kids or no pressure on families. It's just the idea of if you want to get it, we want to provide a service just like we want to provide a service uh, for those people who may need tested. Again, with the ultimate goal, how can we keep these kids in school? Now, I like that we're adding the flu vaccine to that, or is there some way we can reach out maybe um, with council even to promote that to maybe our elderly that would be interested in just coming to the flu, get the flu vaccine here? Well, I know the Plum, uh, Plum Community um, Center. Center is also offering uh, okay. the vaccine as well. So okay. um, when we do hit that button, um, where we send it out, 23,000 people get it. Mm -hmm. um, and so in... If they get it, um, uh, all they have to do is sign up through the website. Um, and 
I'm sure that they're not going to turn them down. So we have no problem with making it a community event as well. That's good. Thank you. And Mr. Hill, I also understand that our local paramedics EMTs can provide the vaccines to people who are in shut-in situations. So if you contact them. Cool. That's all I have. Uh, Any further comments or questions? Uh, for this one, I'll ask, do we have five to move that forward? One, two, three, four. Dr. Anderson? Are you yes or no? What's that? Do you need five? I'm double muted, and every time I do it, I take it off. Yes, I do. Okay. All right. Well, we would have five to move it forward, and uh, if we need to vote on it at the next session, then then we will do so. All right. Next up, uh, so th it's budget and finance, and Mr. Tomarello is not with us tonight. So uh, I guess I'll just step in and I'll read off the items, and Mr. Mazur. Obviously, in any of the administrators, if you can just uh, give us some insight where it's needed. So uh, item A is budgetary items one through two is listed below. Treasurer's reports for October 20, or 2021 and food service bills for October 2021. I don't know if there's any discussion needed on these. None for me. No. Uh, item B, resell the used MacBooks to the highest bidder, reconnect. Any info we need to hear from, from you or any questions or discussion that's needed from the board? Uh, no, just a general overview. Uh, Mr. Loletta did a, a great job uh, following our policy to advertise these bids and soliciting the bids. And um, that highest bidder was Reconnects. And these are um, reselling used MacBooks, which it seems like he does a tre tremendous job mm -hmm. um, making sure we're getting value out of even the MacBooks that we're retiring. And we've gone through this before, done this. Yeah, I believe that's a past practice. Yep. Uh, I assume, are there any objections to moving that forward? No. Uh, the next one is the AIU Joint Purchasing Program Resolution. I think this is pretty annual, too, for us. Yeah, there's a period of time that it relates to, and it was time to uh, update this. Any questions or discussion? No. Any objections to moving this forward? Okay. Establishment of capital reserve fund resolution in the initial transfer. Sure. So this is kind of uh, came up out of necessity, but it's also something that I was going to recommend uh, moving forward uh, for our district. And this resolution established specifically establishes a capital reserve fund. So there are certain standards under the code that um, dictate how you use a capital reserve fund. Primarily, the way that uh, we would use this fund is you're transferring money from the general fund, so our own money to establish this fund. In the past, it looks like we have established capital projects funds based on specific bond offerings with specific conditions. Mm -hmm. So um, I think ongoing, this will be a really nice tool for us. And the way that it's going to work with the 2021 year is that if there are projects that we have started and we've wanted to allocate current year funds for, but we were not able to complete for one reason or another, um, we can do these transfers into a capital projects fund. That capital projects, the expense will then be incurred in the general fund in the year of the transfer. When it is put into a capital projects fund, you're not then restricted based on year. So you don't have to get these projects done by June 30th. You can do them, pay the bills at any point in time because now you have the money in the fund and that run out lasts for a long time just like a bond offering would. Um, specifically in regards to timing, uh, the initial transfer that we have listed here, there's a number of projects that were intended to incur within the 2021 year. And for one reason or another, uh, many are, um, COVID related with delays in shipment. Um, we were trying to buy uh, trucks that uh, were not able to be fulfilled. Uh, there was also delivery issues on a number of these things. And also 
there is a, techn a, a pretty large authorization to pay off uh, technology leases at the very, very end of the year, and these payoffs actually occurred after year end. So instead of pushing that uh, expense into 21-22, this method allows us to incur that expense in 2021. So it just kind of handles a cutoff issue that we're uh, dealing with through the audit. Uh, and then I think moving forward, the intention is here is that we can actually plan within our annual budget to transfer money into this fund. So if we identify a certain amount of projects that we maybe normally would have done in our general fund anyways, we can transfer those funds into the capital projects and then you don't get into this battle of I got to complete this in June to be within the fiscal year or I got to wait until July to get my new budget money for the, for the following year. And then we can start to try to reduce our reliance on bond offerings if we can accumulate some funds, our own funds within these uh, capital projects funds, then we can do some larger projects with our own money as opposed to rather than going out and borrowing. Um, so that's sort of uh, the overall process and a little overview on, on why we're asking for this at this point in time. Well, that well, our, um, I know we, we have a plan to buy, what, five buses a year. Is, will that money also be in this fund then? Or is that, that, that is actually a perfect uh, use of the fund as well. Mm -hmm. there's, there's specific things that the fund uh, points out in the code, and, and one of them actually is uh, school buses. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. we would look to do that, and that's where you do, you, there's a lag time from when you order a bus to when you right. receive a bus, and that Let's would give know. us plenty of time to be able to... Um, uh, handle that. So this this is a really great strategy. I think that we can use now, and then we can plan to use it in the future as well. And then one of the things staring us in the face is, you know, what we're going to do with O Block at some point in time. Um, are we able to project um, putting money in this fund to plan for some of these bigger projects? Like, do we have a five-year plan or two-year plan of how much money we would like to set aside and put in this fund to make sure that we use our money and not borrow money? Yeah. The the establishment of this fund will allow for such a plan. So uh, there can be specific goals that we want to achieve. And one of those is, I think, just generally that we're, that I would like to see is that we just generally reduce our reliance on debt service mm -hmm. and setting aside X number of dollars for a certain project. If we project in five years, yeah. you can do the math and say, this is how much per year you have to put away. Um, and you can build that into as well if you needed to, you could build that into a millage where you're setting that money aside um, as opposed to doing a bond offering and then trying to raise your millage to uh, uh, cover your debt service. So absolutely, that those plans can be uh, developed. And just for clarification for me, um, when you're earmarking these, these dollars into this fund, do you have to, are you then tied to those specific line items or is that something that is flexible within the fund? So um, what, I, what I think is just the best practice is that when we identify an item that we would normally seek board approval on or a budget that we would normally seek board approval on, you will have an idea of what we're trying to accomplish within the capital projects fund, but it will, you're not committed to that allotment. So if something for some reason doesn't happen mm -hmm. and we wouldn't have that expense, we can certainly reallocate it um, appropriately. And you can generally put money into this fund too without a purpose uh, if you wanted to as well, just just to make sure that we have money set aside for something if it, if it were to be a, a repair item or something that would come up. So yes, it, it is still flexible. Thank you. The, the only thing you cannot do with this is you cannot transfer it back to the general fund. So you can't, once it goes to the capital projects fund, you can't have it come back and cover operations. So I'm assuming we'll probably, this will probably pass, but with the creation of the fund, will there be some collaboration with Mr. John Walsh to see what capital improvements need are out there and outstanding and anybody else in my name so we can properly? Absolutely. And I think he's discussed before in just my short time here is, you know, they're completing a, a, a three-year plan, I believe it was, and, and reestablishing a new plan. and this fund can be um, a planning tool as well as our, you know, planning through our general fund as well. Awesome. Any other questions or comments? 
Do we have any objections to moving this forward? No. Uh, with that, then we will uh, be able to move that forward. Uh, the last item is item E, budget transfers, final 2020-2021 budget transfers. So this is a, a related item. Uh, one of those transfers anticipates this uh, transfer to the Capital Projects Fund. Um, and many of the other transfers, this is really a process that is recommended um, through the uh, Auditor General at the state is at the very end of the year, um, you take a look and it's based off of um, how you approve your budget. So you approve your budget based on this one digit of function and, or sorry, two digits of function and one digit of object. Um, and you're transfer, transferring any uh, negative account, um, uh, you're transferring excess budget from a positive account to a uh, uh, account that has a, neg a negative balance. So um, this list is uh, lengthy and um, they're, they're, I researched every one uh, that was over $10,000 and provided a description there for you as well. Uh, so you can read through those. If you have any questions, you can certainly let me know and I can even do uh, further research if necessary. Um, but this is the best practice once you're able to look at your audit report and this is uh, pending any further adjustments in our, in our audit. Sometimes you can't get this perfect, but then every single uh, budget overage would then be covered by a, a transfer that has been authorized by the board. Any questions or comments or discussion? No. Thanks again for the lovely Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> uh, uh, do we have any objections to this? No. We'll move that one forward as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> we will move on to facilities and operations. Mr. Colson, lead board liaison. Thank you. Uh, letter A provides Plum Borough with the use of six of our buses for December 2nd in order to shuttle the Plum community uh, attending Christmas at Plum Creek event from the off-site parking areas. Probably no confusion on that description. <laughs> Any discussion? Uh, any objections to bringing that forward? Pretty thorough description there. <laughs> well, we're going to provide Plum Borough with uh, some of our buses. <laughs> Okay. I get it now. Okay, thanks. And letter B is the uh, quote for a new Kubota coming in a little under 16000 Any objections to moving that forward? None. No. Right, we'll move that forward. Anything else, Mr. Colson? That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next one is Eastern Area Schools. That's Mrs. Stepnick. Um, she's not able to be with us. I did not have a report from her, um, uh, Dr. Island, or any of the administrators. Do you have anything to add on Eastern Area? We do not. Okay. Forbes Road, CTC. Mr. Hill, lead board liaison. I have nothing at this time. All right. Intergovernmental. Mrs. Wetmore, uh, lead board liaison. Nothing at this time. All right, legislative, Mrs. Stepnick, lead board liaison. Again, she's not here. I think the only update we have that we, we should share with the public is that the PSBA, which is the um, School Board Association for Pennsylvania, has withdrawn their membership from the National School Boards Association over some um, disagreements in philosophy, generally speaking. It's not one, it's, it's several. Um, so the... Uh, Pennsylvania School Board Association is looking for another national affiliate because they do want to have a federal um, presence. Um, in the meantime, they're partnering with states who think like-minded. Um, this was not a decision that the delegates of the school districts got to weigh in on. Uh, just so um, I know Mrs. Uh, Stepnick would um, not oppose to, we're both delegates we were disappointed in that, of course, but um, the PSBA does provide some uh, vital training and some uh, opportunities to advocate on the school district's behalf. So uh, Mrs. Uh, Stepnick is going to continue to monitor that and bring reports back to the board and the public and the administration as they, they arise. Any questions or comments on that? Nope. All right, policy. Mr. Kohler, Lee Board Liaison. So I'm going to withhold moving any policies forward for November 
we'll push those out to December so that the newly sworn in board members can participate in that process in December. Thank so you, nothing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cole. Uh, diversity, Mrs. Wackmore, Lee Board Liaison. Um, yes, so letter A, recommend name change. Uh, I would like to have the board consider changing the name from diversity to equity and inclusion as I feel it drives home the point of what we're trying to accomplish better. Diversity is here. Diversity is everywhere. Um, what we're really aiming to do is to provide an equitable education in an inclusive environment. So we want to meet kids where they are and help them achieve their greatest individual potential. And um, we want everybody to do that feeling safe and secure. So I would ask for um, five to move forward the new title of equity and inclusion. Yeah, I'm fine. I think the board president should weigh on that, so I'll know. Okay. Dr. Anderson, you're on double mute, I bet. Yeah. Um, can you tell me what we are voting to make the name change to the standing, please? I think this was an ad hoc committee for an hour. Or is this listed as a standing? Well, it was, and it was, it, was, it was developed by the board president, which is why I made the comment, so he created that ad hoc committee and call it a diversity committee, so my comment would be that I think he should at least weigh in on that, but he's not here tonight, so that's why I'm going to withhold my... Uh, uh, Mr. Dice, can you... This would be, we're going to vote voted and move it forward for a final vote at the um, action meeting? To put on the agenda as a correct. name change, correct? correct? Correct, to move it forward. Yeah, I'm fine with moving it forward. Okay, so we have five to move that forward. Uh, I was going to ask Mr. Dice if there was a point of order that we should consider for that, but it doesn't sound like we need to. We're just pushing it forward to move to the agenda for next um, for the voting meeting. Anything else, Mrs. Wetmore? Um, I actually just want to make note, like you said, Rachel's challenge has started. Um, and it comes with a philosophy of inclusion. And so I'm really excited to see how that goes for us as a district. Um, I was not able to attend the opening event, very disappointed, but I have gotten a lot of very positive feedback from the community. Um, and I also just wanted to note that Ms. S Ms. Sedlak and I are going to get together and review the individuals who attended the uh, brief committee meeting we had about a year ago and we're going to work towards speaking with them in smaller groups about concerns, issues. And um, we feel as though the district is doing a lot of things right, and we're just not doing the best job of communicating what it is we're doing. So we want to make sure that, that we are reading that correctly, and then we hope to be more efficient in the reporting that we bring back to the board and to the community. Thank you, Mrs. Wetmore. All right, next up, we're going to ask for citizens' comments on non-agenda items. Mrs. Macro will uh, give you the spiel um, to allow you to come up. Um, anyone in the audience that would like to step forward to comment on non-agenda items, we ask you to step to the podium one at a time. And please state your name and your residency within Plum. You'll have five minutes to speak. I will provide you with a 30-second um, warning whenever your time is coming to a close. Um, when you're finished speaking, we do ask that you step over to the table and write your name and address down so that I have your name spelled correctly in the minutes. Um, anyone that would like to speak at this time, please step forward. Hey, everybody. Justin Jehovic, 20 Leanne Court. I, I promise I won't mention Bob Marley this time, Adam. Um, but it is related to the Sunshine Act. And I had a question, some confusion, maybe this would be to the solicitor, because this actually isn't a non-agenda item. The vaccination clinics were not on 7B in the agenda that we have here for that. And it didn't look like it was on the online version either that we were looking at. So my question would be, when was it added? Because under Pennsylvania law, it has to be posted at least 24 hours in advance. And then you may have answered the other question, is that what was actually voted on for those things? So I, I, I think that, it, you know, we can bring up the Sunshine Act and do that again, but it has to be 24 hours in advance. And yeah, that's been in place since August um, 29th, 
So it applies to any matters in here, and I don't know if this is an action meeting or discussion meeting type thing. So that's discussion. my discussion. So this, that wouldn't be, so that's why I'm allowed to talk about it, because it wasn't on the agenda. <laughs> so is, is that, should it not be tabled and discussed at the, the next meeting, because it wasn't brought to the public within 24 hours, so you're in breach of the Sunshine Act? I would say, one, um, it was discussed in executive session, and then it was, after it was discussed in executive session, it was added to the agenda, but it's not being voted on until November 20th, I think 26th is when our meeting is, so it will be on the agenda for November 26th before any formal vote. Is that accurate, Nay? Uh, that's accurate, and I'll say as well, uh, that didn't have to be added to the agenda um, to a certain extent. I don't know why it was. My position was that involved lease of property, as we've been talking about this whole time. So that's an executive session item and um, probably shouldn't have been added. So yep, That was me in an effort to be transparent after we talked about an executive session. Yeah, and I think that what I encourage you guys to, as I spoke last time and I spoke to many of you guys individually, and I, I see the, one of the next items, so I won't steal anybody's thunder, that I, I think that the more transparency and communication is, is really required in advance. And I would even up it to beat the Sunshine Act, you know, do better than the Sunshine Act. So I, I think that as, as Director Whitmore just said, there's some things that maybe could be done better from a communication perspective. I understand that, I agree with that. So don't just hit the mark, beat the mark. So don't be 24 hours in advance, be, be three days in advance. Let the community know what's going on, be more communicative on everything that's going on, be transparent. I think that you know we had a discussion about that last time and I would encourage you to do that as well. That's all I got, thanks. Thank you. Amy Bocherry, 309 Aberdeen. I'm going to piggyback off of it because it wasn't on the agenda either. Um, my question with the PCR testing are, um, you said that somebody is being certified to administer these, I miss, but nobody's really administering it than the students, correct? Okay. Um, so my question with that is with the, ch with the children spitting into their own sample here or mechanism, what is the likelihood of a mix-up if it's all being put into one box? What is then the likelihood of a cross-contamination if it is all being placed into one box? What about PPE being used for those who are going to interact with those children who may be symptomatic and requiring it? Um, who's going to foot that bill? Um, um, and then my big thing that I have a question with is, so if it's a positive test, the parent gets a phone call, then the school nurse, and then the contact tracers. If it's a negative, it goes directly to the school nurse and then she will send an email. Why, is, why am I still not the first point of contact when it is my child, whether positive or negative? So I, do, do we look at a broader picture here of parents should still be first contact, positive and or negative, versus the school nurse if it's negative. Um, and then I'm, I'm concerned with the bio waste. Um, because either way, that is now going to be contaminated, whether it is a positive PCR or a negative. It is now a contaminated product. It is a, it's, it's a bio waste. And the likelihood of mix-up or cross-contaminations. Those are my concerns. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments at this time? Hi, Chad Stubbs, 506 Press Ava Drive. Um, this is non-COVID related. I wanted to address property assessment appeals and the school board's role and or potential power in that process. Currently, obviously, a lot of people are seeing uh, real estate markets, prices, values skyrocketing, mostly due to lower mortgage rates. In Plum, it is definitely a seller's market. Property values are increasing dramatically. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the number was 100,000 that a property value needs to go up before it's targeted for an assessment appeal. That target is, it, it is actually the school board that's targeting these assessment appeals. If you look at the majority of homes in Plum, 
most of the sales that are going to occur at this time are going to qualify for that number. In allowing this to continue, you're going to see at the next county reassessment, all of our homes are now going to have comps with skyrocketed assessment appeals. I just wanted to bring this to the attention so that we can open up a discussion on how to figure out a better way to manage this situation. That's all. Thank you. We don't have anything to do with assessments. Like, I've never seen a vote come across to maybe assess a property or. Yeah, that's normally just a mechanism done by us, and that's where we have parameters we use. Um, ultimately, you may have input into it if you would like. Um, I, I will say, though, 100,000 is actually one of the higher numbers for a difference. There's many districts I know from just talking to other solicitors that use 50,000 as a difference. Um, and I'll also say that when there's a reassessment, what they'll look at is they comp it with recent sales. So as always, whenever there's assessment appeals done right now, what drives it is recent sales that are comparable in both uh, type of house and proximity to the sale, the home. And um, whenever there is a reassessment, and who knows when that'll be by the county, that's what they'll look at as well, our recent sales. That's always the driver. Yeah. I've always disagreed with that, and, and it always seems to be when somebody moves into the community and buys a home, and the home's purchased, and somebody may have been in that home for a long period of time, so the assessment was lower. So it's like, uh, welcome to the community. We're going to reassess your taxes. Yeah. Um, it happened to me in yeah, 2005, like 10, right? like and 10, right? I've never agreed with that. Um, so, I mean, am I allowed to, re to respond to any of this? Go for it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but again, but again, Plum's not the only out. school district that does it. So yeah. I mean, it, it's happened to, to many people, many districts. But again, I don't, I don't agree with it. But it is what it is. Though the values can be different for every community, we have the ability to control that within our community, and. Right now, I can go online. I didn't save any numbers for any houses because I know this isn't an agenda item, so I wasn't bringing evidence or anything factual here to, to give a long list of items. However, I looked at houses that are you know, entry-level starter homes that recently sold all the way up to roughly around 400 and some thousand dollars. That full spectrum qualifies for that $100,000 hit. So you're looking at homes that are falling in the 175 range all the way up to 400,000 where these homes are being that qualify in that targeted range. That's not the norm. Three years ago, most people wouldn't have to consider this situation. Right now, nearly every single home buyer is going to have to consider this. And on top of that, who knows when this assessment is going to happen? It may not happen for five years. It could happen in two years. We don't know. It's not going to happen in the next year. We'd already be hearing about it. But they will look at similar size, design, and appeal homes. That's how comps are made. I don't care what anybody says. That is how comps are made. So when you have a house that was reassessed at 350000 that two years ago would have been assessed at 190. Your $350,000, your, your home that may be similar is going to go up. And the tax jumps on these are anywhere from 30 to nearly 100% of the current value right now. My house went up almost 100%. Any other comments at this time? Can we grab that for a minute? Uh, we granted it to the other gentleman, so yes, we will give you your, your other minute. <laughs> I just wanted to be, so, Director Clore confirmed that it, Justin, you have a 20 land court. Um, 
just being funny. Um, that this is a, just a discussion meeting, but you guys voted on the clinic proceeding, and the action meeting is not till the 23rd, but it's the clinic's on the- those items no, forward to the agenda of the voting meeting. Two voted, so not was there the 20th mentioned as the clinic, or is that, did, did I, was yeah. I, was I hearing things? Potential date, potential date. But how could that be if the action meeting is the 23rd? Like I said, potential date. We're not sure whether we're going to be able to get that date or you not. You couldn't because you couldn't vote on it until after the 23rd. Or Correct. on the 21st, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, so it's not the 20th. I misspoke on that. Okay, gotcha. Thank you for my, my original minute. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. Doesn't look like we have any uh, further comments. Um, some upcoming public meetings, something noteworthy. This is a little different. Uh, coffee with the board and cabinet will be held on Thursday, November 18th, 2021 at 6 p.m. here in the library. It's an opportunity to come and have a, a more of a discussion than we get to have at school board meetings. So uh, we hope to see you there. Um, and then the next one is the action meeting that will occur on November 23rd, 2021. Again, that'll be at 7 p.m. here in the library. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? All right, we're adjourned. Thank you so much. <laughs>